9, 10th Insight Equanimity to all formations becoming The door to the insights surrounding Nibbana and beyond Last week I spoke about dissolving, Bhanganana, seeing danger, Bhayanana, seeing disadvantage in the mental and physical process, Adhanavanana. Being very disenchanted, Nibbidanana, wanting to be free from the process, Munsitukamayadanana, and Padasankanana is very important. To be free from something, first we need to understand it, and to understand something we need to look at it very carefully. Otherwise there is no way to overcome anything, even on a mundane level, in our body, in our life, in any situation. The first thing necessary to overcome. Anything is to look at it very carefully. To understand it very deeply, completely. And then to overcome it. We cannot run away. Running away it is not overcoming. There is no place to hide, nowhere to go. In Burmese we say there is no land you can escape to. Wherever you go you are in the process, you take it with you, physical and mental process. Only through understanding can we overcome. When we feel that we are trapped in this process and we want to escape, sometimes we might have thought that. If I just don't pay attention to these things, just turn away and forget about them, I will be free. No, this is not the right thing to do. The meditator comes to a point when he feels that watching this mental and physical process it is so boring, so disenchanting, there is nothing good about it. Just by watching it we don't really get peaceful. Only in the beginning, you feel very calm and peaceful because the very gross defilements have subsided for a while. But after a while just watching the mental and physical process is very tiring, not just boring. It is a kind of being trapped in the process. We don't want to see it anymore, we are really tired of it. But there is no other way to escape from it, other than paying it even closer attention, looking at it even more closely. Looking at it with deeper and stronger attention the mind becomes more calm and quiet. Mindfulness and samadhi become stronger, and then the mind becomes very detached, which is called Sankaripekhanana. You are still watching it very closely. But with a totally detached mind. A totally detached attitude. A total disidentification. You don't see it as a self. But with total detachment. With total equanimity, but very strong attention. Sikram means anything conditioned. Actually it means mental and physical process. This process is called Sikra and Upekha means equanimity. There are many aspects of equanimity, the energy of balance. You are not trying too hard. You are not relaxing too much, because both extremes are unbalanced. Trying too hard is unbalanced, relaxing too much and also taking it easy is unbalanced. Before that stage, you are too anxious to overcome. I want to get out of it, I want to overcome it, I want to escape, that is also a kind of agitation, imbalance in the mental attitude. When you come to this Sankarapekhanana you are not too anxious to overcome it. With total equanimity you just pay complete attention to it. Even before this stage, in the fourth insight which is Udaya Bayanana. Seeing arising and passing away very clearly, you have some sort of equanimity, Upekha, sometimes but in that Nana it happens sometimes, only. Sometimes you have a lot of joy, sometimes you feel very happy, sometimes you see very clearly and even get attached to that clear insight. In this stage you are not even attached to seeing things clearly, you are not even attached to this equanimity. In the Udaya Bayanana stage you feel so calm and balanced and you like it very much. Meditation is so easy, it is just happening, but you lose it again and again. In this stage you don't lose it anymore. You keep practicing and maintaining it and it stays for a long time, equanimity stays for a long time. You feel so detached that this equanimity is compared to the equanimity of an arahant. An arahant stays in that mental state all the time. A person, who is not enlightened, can stay there by maintaining constant awareness, but for an arahant the awareness is natural. He never loses this equanimity, this awareness. Actually, in Vipassananana there are only three nanas i.e. Anaksa, Dukkha, and Anatta. But different degrees of experiencing Anaksa, 
Dukkha. Ananita make the insights different. In Burma, a teacher who taught meditation spoke about only these three nanas, seeing impermanence, becoming disenchanted with impermanence and ending of impermanence. Even before this stage of insight the meditator has experienced to a certain degree some aspects of this equanimity. Only at this stage it is complete, total. Sakes of a Sikra Vipassanti VSM 628 Vipassanti means to look at it very deeply in a very extraordinary way. Ordinarily we see and understand things but in this stage we see things extraordinarily, very clearly. Sakesava means the Sikra only. Sikra means at the Sikra. The first Sikra means the mind that is watching. The second Sikra means at the Sikra or towards the Sikra which is the object. It could be Rupa or Vedana or Siddha, any of the five Khandas. Vipassanti means watching. One process is watching another process, know you anymore. In this stage it becomes so clear that you really feel it, there is no I watching this. To break through, this sort of total disidentification is necessary, and requires this kind of strong balance. Upekha has many meanings, happiness, unhappiness. Neither happy nor unhappy is also called Upekha. Happiness is one extreme, unhappiness is another extreme. Neither happy nor unhappy is a kind of Upekha. In this stage the meditator is neither happy nor unhappy. Before this stage sometimes you get very happy about the way you see so clearly. Sometimes you feel unhappy about being trapped in the process, but now there is no happiness or unhappiness. Total balance, total equanimity. Before this stage, sometimes the energy is too much, or too little, now not too much, not too little, just right. Before this insight we see sakras, any kind of process as disadvantage, as not good, this process is not good. We become sort of unhappy about it, but not the negative kind of unhappiness. We become disenchanted. But in this stage there is no unhappiness about it anymore. Before this stage, there is the wanting to escape. And thinking of what to do about it. Now wanting to escape or doing anything about. It is not there anymore. Now there is total complete attention only which becomes even simpler. Meditation becomes very simple now. Sometimes, before this stage, because you see mental and physical process as disadvantage, you don't want to pay complete attention. So you turn away thinking that meditation is not satisfying anymore or that it is not as good as it used to be, but now this is not present anymore. The mind is totally detached, totally disidentified, no desire to be otherwise anymore just watching it, very simply. This is the best state of mind, not wanting to do anything anymore, just paying total attention. Just try to imagine that state of mind and see how free you can feel, you don't want to be otherwise. No matter what happens it does not matter, just total attention. Even thinking or imagining makes you very peaceful. All our life, we are grabbing or grasping or pushing things away. All the time we are doing these two things, reaching out and grabbing, trying to keep things or pushing them away. That is very tiring. In this state of mind, we are not grabbing or reaching for anything anymore. We are not pushing things away. And we are just paying total attention. In a way it is a kind of total surrender to the process. Let anything happen, I'll just pay complete attention. This is just the right attitude. At this stage you are not worrying about anything anymore. Even if you die at that moment you feel completely okay about it. We'll die one day, and the best way to die is to be in that mental state, to accept the process completely. To pay total attention and to understand it, no resistance, and no fear. This is the best mental state to have when one dies. I told you once, I was very sick a few times with malaria, tonsillitis, chronic dysentery, it went on for many months. I became very weak and sick and about to die. At first I was really worried and afraid to die. I didn't want to die. I said no, no, I want to live. But the harder I tried to hold on to life the more tiring it became, because I worried too much. 
Somebody must do something for me, nobody is doing anything for me, why have they given up, nobody is around. As I couldn't move, I couldn't call anybody. I was thinking, why are they just leaving me, going away and doing nothing for me, that kind of thought made me even more unhappy and tired. At last I thought, maybe they have given up because they cannot do anything anymore and one of my friends said he must be in coma because I was not moving anymore. For a long time, I just tried to hold on to life, but at one point I was very tired and I thought it would be really nice to just sleep. To go to sleep peacefully. I determined to let go. But I made a very important determination. I thought if I have to die. I will die mindfully and let go of all thoughts and keep the mind as relaxed and calm as possible and maintain mindfulness. Slowly and slowly the mind became more and more peaceful and I noticed that I was not so tired anymore. Tiredness was gone as well, the mind became more calm and peaceful and I fell asleep. When I woke up again the mind was very calm and peaceful again. I could not move or say anything and I thought that if I died at that moment it would really be okay. Why are we afraid to die? Because we are attached, if we have no attachment there will not be any fear. Meditation is a very good preparation for death, it is necessary, it is very important. People do not want to think about death. Whenever they hear about death they don't want to hear about it, they don't want to talk about it, they just want to talk about living. But those who are prepared to die, they are ready to live. Most of us although we are alive, we are not really living. We are resisting life so much. We are not really paying attention. And learning enough from our lives. Whenever I think of this insight I find it to be the best insight. Because we cannot die with the mental state of Magga or Phala, even Buddha didn't do that, he couldn't do that. At this stage the mind has no fear, it is very pure and clear. The mind is very balanced and it feels very peaceful too, no excitement, no joy, no elation, no happiness just very peaceful. There is nothing in worldly states of consciousness that is comparable to it. No effort, no tension, no tightness. Before this state we try very hard to concentrate, to meditate, we become tight, we have to remind ourselves to relax. But in this stage everything is so soft, gentle, and relaxed. Although the mind is very peaceful, there is no attachment to it. This is a very important point. Before this stage we feel peacefulness even in the fourth insight, but we get attached to it and it becomes a hindrance. Peacefulness in itself it is not a hindrance. But attachment to it is a hindrance. At this stage there is no attachment at all. That is why it is so pure. Attachment is a kind of desire, a kind of labha, craving. And the mind is not excited about anything at all. In the fourth insight sometimes the mind gets excited and so happy about it but now there is no excitement anymore. Very subtle, very clear, very precise, just on the right moment, on the spot, every noticing is just right, not before, not after. In the beginning stage, Sometimes the awareness or attention is lagging behind. Something happens, later we remember that something happened and we didn't pay attention. Sometimes we are expecting something to happen, and say something will happen and I'll pay attention to that. Like when we are moving, we are thinking that I am going to move and I'll pay attention to it. Our attention is a little bit off, not right on the spot. At this stage it is naturally always ready and on the point. Something is happening and knowing and attention is already there. That is why we are not trying or becoming too anxious even to paying attention, it is just happening perfectly. Evamivam sabasakrihi munsitukamohutva padasang kanyapasanaya. Sankur parigan hanto. Aham, mama ti gahetabamadisva, bayan ca nandan ca vipahia. Sabasakrizuhudasano hodi mehihato. VSM 656. Thus, Evamiva, wanting to be free, Munsitukamohutva, from all the Sikras, Sabasakrihi. By watching the Sikra again, Padasang Kanyapasanaya, observing the Sikra, Sikra Parigan Hanto. Not seeing me or mine, Aham, Mama Tiai Gahetabamadisva. 
Gahetabam means to take, to grasp, to keep. Adisva means not seeing, aham is I, mama is mine. Whenever you watch Sakra you know that this is not me, not mine, nothing to get attached to, you cannot keep anything, not worth the trouble. In every noticing you see that this is not me, not mine, you are not concerned with it and you are totally indifferent. Before this stage you see it as a danger, at this stage no danger, no liking, not disliking also. Vipahya means eradicating, overcoming, overcoming fear, bayan ca, an attachment, nandan ca. Being just in the middle, hudasano hodi mehihato, in all the processes, sabasakrazu, not to this side, not to that side. This is the middle path actually. We are getting very close to the real middle path. Before this stage, the mind is on either one side or the other. Not in the middle. Mahihato means right in the middle. Sometimes when you relax for a while or even when you are relaxing, your mind is still mindful. A thought might come in very briefly, it might not even last for a second. When I say a thought, don't think that at that moment you are thinking in a sentence or words. At this point there are no words or sentences. You are just clearly seeing that this is just empty process, no being, no I, devoid of being, devoid of soul. Sunamita Matina Va Atani Yena Vati MN 3.263 This process is devoid of I or mine or mine belonging. Similar thoughts and insight come before but at this stage it is more and more clear. This process does not obey anybody's wish, you can also see that, it is something that is just happening. Puna Kaparam, Pik Hav, Aryazavako Iti Patasansakati. Naham Kvekani Kisasi Kinkane Tasmim. Naca Mama Kvekani Kisman Si Kinkanam Natha Ti. MN 3.263-4 Naham kvekani kasasi kinkane tasmim, there is nothing that I need to worry about and, nobody needs to worry about me. Sometimes in our ordinary everyday thinking we worry about other people. And sometimes we worry that others worry about us and we like that also, oh, somebody is concerned about me. But now you can see that I don't need to be concerned about anything or anybody and nobody needs to be concerned about me. There is nothing there. There is just process. There are many detailed explanations in the text, but it is useful only for scholars. But here at this stage, Ivam Eva says Sankara Pekhananam Santipadam Nibanam Santato Pasati. Sabam Sakrapavadam Visajetva Nibanam Eva Pakhandati. No CE Pasati Punapana Saksaramanam Eva Hutva Pavatati. VSM 657. At this stage, the meditator sees that the end of this process is real peace. Santipadam Nibanam Santato Pasati. We want to be in a certain form, in a certain life, in a certain state. We crave for that. We don't want to let go of all forms, all existence. But at this stage the mind can see very clearly that the end of the process is real peace. Before the mind has developed enough energy and clarity to give up the process. Although the meditator can understand that every process is unsatisfactory, the mind still falls back into watching the process. When the mind develops enough energy, it gives up all sakras and goes into nibbana, sabam sakrapavidam visajetva nibbanam eva pakhandati. If the person cannot do that, the mind again and again comes back and watches the sakra. The arising and passing away of mental and physical process, no ce pasati punapana saksaramanam eva hutva pavatati. This happens again and again. The mind sometimes wants to reach into Nibbana but there is not enough energy to do that. It falls back and watches physical and mental process arising and passing away until it builds up more and more clarity. When this happens, one should understand that process. Some people become discouraged and say I fall back again and again. However, this is very natural. A few weeks ago I told you that you hold on to a rope, there is a very deep gorge, a deep gap between two mountains, like a deep opening in between. There is a tree and some kind of very thick vine hanging there. You take hold of the rope and swing. But when you feel that your swinging is not strong enough you are afraid that you will fall in between. 
so you cannot let go of the rope and come back to this side again. Then you build up more momentum and swing again. After a few times you feel that you have developed enough momentum, then you swing and let go and you are going very fast, very fast, and then, you let go of the rope. At that moment you are not on this side and not on the other side either. You are in the middle but you have let go of this side. Can you come back? No, no way you can come back because you have let go of the rope. Although you are not on that side, you are going there with all the energy and momentum you have built up. No way to stop it anymore. Having let go of this side means, you are not watching the physical and mental phenomena anymore. And you are seeing that the mind is going towards total cessation, the end of physical and mental phenomena. So from this Sankaripekhanana the next Nana which, if and when it happens, is this state where you have already let go. This swinging state is called Sankaripekha and Parakama Anuloma Gotrabite. Parakama means trying again and again, preparing your mind, developing momentum, and Anuloma means the same mental state but with more momentum. Gotrabite means you have let go, that means you are cut off from this side already but not yet on the other side. Then you fall into the cessation of mental and physical process, Nibbana, which is called Magga Consciousness. It happens very quickly, in a succession of very short moments, because each mental state lasts for a very short period, maybe a thousandth or a millionth of a second. Each mental state happens consecutively and at that moment you cannot return anymore. After that, there is total quietness, total stillness, nothing arising, nothing passing away, no watching anymore, because you cannot watch anymore. Before you go into the Nibbanic state you can see from the outside what it could be because you understand that. If this mental and physical process stops there will be total peace, but you are not yet in it. When you are in it you are not observing it anymore. Because to be able observe it you must be out of it. That's why when the person is in this Nibbanic state one is not watching Nibbana anymore. One cannot watch it. One cannot even watch one's mental state. Only after this state, there is another insight which is called Pake Vekhana, where you reflect. Something has happened, a moment ago it was very peaceful, there was no arising no passing away, very calm, very clear, total peace. That zooming into and going into cessation is a very powerful state of mind. Once that has happened, you feel totally different. After a while, when you come out of it, because Magga happens one moment only, Phala happens for two moments, maybe three depending on the energy. Then after that you reflect on what happened. When this reflection is happening the mind is very calm and peaceful, you look back and think about it. This Pake Vekhananana is actually a kind of thinking. You think and understand that total peace is total cessation from mental and physical process. The person reflects on many things, on Magga, Phala, Nibbana, and eradication of defilements and those defilements that are still left. The first stage of enlightenment eradicates wrong view of self and doubt, Dithi, and Visakika, total eradication. Even in the first insight you have overcome some of Dithi and Visakika. Wrong view of self and doubts about what happened before and later, and many other doubts. In this state there is total eradication of doubt and wrong view. So here's a few very important words, a few sentences. Tikavasatis rabbit venus sakrazuaj huapekhane sijhamanatam panatam sankarapekhananamanakavaram pavatamanam paripakagamanana anulomatanasa pakayabhavam gakantam. VSMA 2, 459. Tika means very sharp. Visata means very clear, and srabit vena, which is very important, sra means very brave. We are so attached to things that even if they are very painful we cannot let go. Even to let go of them we need a lot of courage, trust, and courage in the process. That is why sometimes people can feel that something is going to happen and if it does, everything will be changed. I will not be the same anymore, and they stop there, they don't want to change. They want to be the same. We have very conflicting motivations. We want to change. We want to be free. We want to be peaceful but we want to stay the same. Many psychologists point this out. Some people are in a neurotic state, 
but they are attached to their neurotic state it. Some people are in depression but they are attached to their depression. It's very difficult to understand but it is really true. Although we know that this process is tiring, so painful but when the moment comes. When we can see that something is going to happen and we will be totally changed. That we won't be the same anymore, that we won't feel the same anymore, we are afraid. We need a lot of courage to change. Without changing how can we really grow? If we want to stay the same we cannot grow. So this word Srabitvina is very important. With a lot of courage, we keep watching the Sikras, Sikras Uachhupekhain, watching the phenomena, the process, arising and passing away. That insight of the process, Tam Panatam Sankarapekhananam, happens many times, Anakavaram Pavatamanam. Again and again, it builds up more and more momentum and energy, becoming ripe, Paripakagamanana. For some insights to become really ripe and mature it needs to happen again and again, so that it becomes stronger and stronger. It is like anger. If you think of something that makes you angry, the more you think about it the angrier you become and you explode. It is a similar process, you look at the sikra and become more and more detached, until you are really ready to let go, then you let go now. The moment you let go, you are free. We want to be free and we are holding on to I want to be free. I want to be free but why don't we let go? We think that in this mental and physical process there is something worth keeping. There is something that belongs to me, there is something that I like, although I don't like part of it but there is a part of it that I like. We are holding on to it. But when you really see that there is nothing to keep, nothing to hold on to, it does not belong to me, I don't want it anymore. When you are totally in that state you just let go. A lot of people used to come to my teacher, they used to say Venerable Sir. I really don't like to be reborn anymore, I am totally disenchanted with life, it is so tiring, very small enjoyment and too much pain, too much burden. At that time, I was a very young monk, ordained only a few months. My teacher said if you really don't want it you won't get it, I was very surprised. I don't want it but. Is it that simple? Later I understood that although we say we don't want it, we are still holding on to it I don't want it, I don't want it. Why don't we let go? My teacher's way of talking was very gentle. He never put in too much energy. He never tried to convince anybody. He never tried to convert anybody. When many of his supporters and students asked the same questions, monks and lay people, he would say if you really don't want it you won't get it. You are getting it because you want it. It is that simple. We are getting it because we want it. We are unhappy because we want unhappiness, but we are denying it. We say we only want happiness. But what do you mean by happiness? Fulfilling desire? If we really don't want it, then we are free. The courage to change is very important. We need a lot of courage. To change, to learn, to grow. I think there is a lot of psychological significance in this point, to be brave, and also to be pure. To want to be free means to want to be pure. If we really want to be free, we must purify ourselves, purifying sila, purifying samadhi, and purifying wisdom. Without purification we cannot be free. That is why this big textbook on meditation is called the The Path of Purification, Visuddhi Magga. By purification we become free, this is very clear. If we really want to be free we have to really look deep inside, what am I doing and with what motivation? Are my sila, precepts, behavior and motivation pure? Is my mind clear and pure? Am I brave enough? If we are worthy of it, we will get it. So we need to live our lives in such a way that we are worthy of it. We want something but if we are not worthy of it we will not get it. Any kind of thing, e.g. If I want your respect, if I am worthy of it, I will get it. If I want your metta, your loving kindness, if I am worthy of it I will get it. So whatever happens in our life happens because we deserve it. We don't get anything undeservedly. A lot of us complain oh. Why should this happen to me? 
just tell yourself because I deserve it. Whether it is good or not good. Hinges happen to us because we deserve it. Once you understand this very clearly you stop blaming. You even stop blaming your kama. You stop blaming your parents or the government. We are blaming, we are putting responsibility on another person or situation. We are not taking enough responsibility. Once you see that things happen to you because you deserve it. Then you learn and grow and change. Then things get better and better. This right mental attitude is very important in everything we do. In the last few moments of this breakthrough, among these three characteristics of process, Anaksa, Dukkha, Anatta, one of them will become very clear. For example, if a person can see Anaksa, arising and passing away, more clearly, they will see Anaksa, Anaksa, Anaksa very clearly, and will not switch to another characteristic. This is another important point to remember. In the beginning stage sometimes you switch from Anaxa to Dukkha or Anatta and back and forth. Then, by staying with one characteristic only, the characteristic becomes clear. These things are very difficult to understand if you haven't experienced them, but once you do it is quite natural. You see that it is quite natural that things should happen that way. In that last moment you either observe physical process, Rupa, or mental process, Vedana, Sana, Sakra, or Vinana. From the five Khandas you observe only one because you cannot observe all five in the same moment. As one consciousness can observe only one object at a time, because you have to observe it repeatedly. If for example you are observing Vedana, you'll observe Vedana and Anaksa, or Vedana Dukkha, or Vedana Anatta. If you are observing Rupa you see Rupa as Anaksa, Dukkha, or Anatta. Only one object and only one aspect of the three characteristics repeatedly. You don't switch to another object or another characteristic. These are very important points to know. That's why when in your meditation you are paying attention to Vedana, and it becomes more and more clear, stay with it, it is very important to make it even clearer. With any kind of mental state, pay attention to it again and again. Make it more and more clear. You understand all those things in general, but if you understand one thing completely that is enough. From the moment of letting go, the mind cannot observe any of the five khandas. It cannot see impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, or non-self, non-ego anymore. It can only see total quietness, cessation. Then the person understands that Nibbana means total cessation of phenomena. This is very difficult to talk about. It is not something that does not exist. Because if we say that Nibbana means nothing exists, then we can also say that Nibbana does not exist. Nibbana is an experience. At that moment, the object and the watching stop. The two things stop. A person feels that everything has come to an end. How do you give an example of that? This state is beyond words. We cannot talk about it. It is like as if you are carrying a very big burden and you drop it. Or you are pulling something very heavy and the rope snaps. A Pali sentence which is short and clear. Yam kinsi samade ad ham am, sabam tamnara ad ham an ti. SNV.423 Samade ad ham am means the nature to arise. Whatever, yam kinsi, has the nature to arise, all that, sabam tam has the nature to disappear, Nara Adhamam. You see this very clearly, anything that has the nature to arise has the nature to completely pass away. After that insight the person reflects on the experience and sees that the ending of Sankara is total Nibbana, total peace. And after a while one comes back to meditation again. When the person comes back to meditation again, he begins from arising and passing away again, not from Sakrupek the tenth insight, but he begins from the fourth insight again. This is also another aspect of the breakthrough. After the breakthrough you can see arising and passing away again, very clearly. There are a few important things about what changes. The person has overcome Sakya Dithi, believing in self, Visakika, doubts. Also Silabhata Paramasa is very important. There are many methods of meditation and many people are meditating. We can say that they are meditating, meditation has many aspects. 
but if the person believes that just practicing samatha can bring total freedom, this is a kind of silabhata paramasa. There were some ascetics in the time of the Buddha, who believed that just by behaving like a cow it would free you, you would just burn out all your defilements. Practicing like an animal, and torturing the body you'd burn out all your defilements, you'd become pure. That is a kind of wrong practice. Silabhata paramasa means wrong practice, practicing something wrong and believing that it will lead to freedom. Once a person has breakthrough. At this point he can understand. That no other practice can really lead to liberation. Only that practice which has this eightfold noble path. Can lead to liberation, freedom. To the experience of Nibbana. No other practice can lead to that. Any practice which does not have this eightfold noble path, although it can give you some sort of quietness and peacefulness of mind, can never lead you to liberation. It has its own value, just like practicing samatha it has its own value but it will not lead to liberation. It might be a stage of your practice but not the end stage. It cannot lead to the real end, the real goal. There are many other practices and many people say that, if you practice that path, that will also lead to Nibbana. No, the only way that leads to Nibbana is watching your own mental and bodily processes. For the foundation, you keep your sila pure. You keep your livelihood pure, because without that sort of purity the mind will never build enough courage, momentum, and clarity. If you live with guilt, you'll never be free to observe things clearly and let them go. Guilt is a prison, it traps you where you are. Whenever you feel guilt or shame you cannot make any progress. Keeping sila pure, your livelihood pure. Keeping your mind very pure is necessary. Without that sort of purity there cannot be real freedom. Some people meditate and think that it is not really important to keep the five precepts. They don't really try their best to keep them. If you don't keep the five precepts and you meditate and believe that will lead you to liberation. That is silabhata paramasa, wrong practice, clinging to wrong practice, believing in wrong practice. Some people in their meditation sometimes experience a very pure and peaceful mental state once in a while, and they mistake it for real Nibbana. When the person experiences real Nibbana, he can see that it was not real Nibbana. Mistakes about Nibbana are also overcome. Only in the third stage of enlightenment. Can the person totally overcome greed, anger, and frustration? The first stage of enlightenment does not eradicate desire, greed, anger, or frustration, only wrong view and doubts. A Sotapanna still enjoys sense pleasure, but he has his sila very pure and he will never break his sila, not even the desire to break his sila. For example, he enjoys good food too, but he will never break his sila to get his food or any other thing like that. His livelihood is very pure also. Even if he is still doing business he will never cheat. He may get upset, sad, and angry but whenever he takes time to watch that mental state, he can see that it is just a mental state and come out of it very quickly. He will not be trapped in that mental state. The second stage of enlightenment, does not totally eradicate any defilements. It only weakens labha and dosa. It weakens, greed anger, frustration. Even after the third stage of enlightenment this person still has some defilements, still clinging to a very special life, a pure existence, not enjoying his sense pleasure, no anger. But he still enjoys pure peaceful happiness. Also there is some sort of satisfaction which is very close to a kind of pride. You are very satisfied by your achievements, this is a very subtle form of pride and clinging, a kind of desire. You see some very subtle forms of pride, of attachment, and that can be overcome only by the fourth enlightenment stage. If a person is a judge and he becomes a Sotapanna, he will never do anything wrong, never take bribe or be corrupted, he is very fair and honest. The first enlightenment stage eradicates the hindrance, Nivarana, of Visakika, doubt. And the hindrances of very strong greed, Kamakanda, very strong aversion, Vyapada. Regret, Kukaksa, is overcome by the third stage of enlightenment. This is a very important thing to think about. 
In some other teachings we hear that if a person has done something wrong and he thinks about his misdeed and feels unhappy about it, laments, cries and beats himself up, they think that this is a good thing to do, that regret is a good thing. But in the teachings of the Buddha, this is not good. What do we mean by that? If a person has done something very wrong, then is it very good not to regret? Regret that comes with deep understanding is good, which means that you don't go on crying about it, but you learn from it. Yes I have done something wrong and I will not do it again. If I have to suffer for it, okay I am brave enough to suffer for my own deeds, but I am not going to cry for it anymore. No use in just dwelling on what you have done. Feeling unhappy about it without being able to do anything else. Don't waste your time. If you have done something wrong learn from it and correct yourself. Go on and do something good, go on, go ahead with your work. You see, the Buddha teaching is to go ahead and to learn and to grow. You know the root meaning of the word kukaksa? Although we translate it as regret, remorse, the root word for kukaksa is kut and kata, the two together make the word kukaksa. Kud means bad, kata means done. But that doesn't explain the meaning very clearly. The real meaning of this word is that if you are in remorse and that is something very ugly, that in itself is something unwholesome. Look deep into your mind, when you are in remorse, what is your mental state? Is it peaceful? No. If you look at it very deeply, you see that the more you regret, the more it shows that you are clinging to it and that you are clinging to self also. It is very interesting to look at these things. Even a Sotapanna cannot really overcome, Kukaksa, not even the second stage of enlightenment, Sakatagami, can overcome that. Only the third stage, Anagami, can eradicate regret and remorse. Moral shame, moral dread is associated with understanding and wisdom. Because of this, you are not going to do that. But what if you have done something wrong, and you feel regret? And when you feel ashamed why do you feel ashamed? Is it because somebody has found out? If that is the reason, then that is not real moral shame. This is just protecting your self-image, even bigger ego, it is protecting your ego. Real moral dread and shame is associated with wisdom. This is shameful, I won't do that. If you have done something you realize is very shameful then. You won't do it anymore. You don't go on living with that shame and regret and not being able to do anything better. You have to overcome that shame and regret and go on and do something better, change yourself, correct yourself. One must understand it with compassion and forgiveness because it is natural for us to make mistakes. Even Venerable Ananda did something very terrible when he was fulfilling his paramis. Even the Buddha-to-be, did something terrible, he seduced a woman. Venerable Ananda was once a goldsmith and a lot of rich and beautiful women came to him to make jewelry, and he seduced a lot of them. That does not mean that it is okay to do that, but because of greed, desire, lust people do such things. Even from those mistakes you can learn and grow and become liberated. The person, who is enlightened, keeps his sila pure and intact with no need for justification. I hear a lot of justifications, People say although he is enlightened, because of too much temptation he did this and that. Justifications Five precepts is the minimum, there is no justification. In the time of the Buddha there were many other religious groups and some of them believed that. Although the person has attained the first stage of enlightenment. Because he still has greed, anger, frustration, pride he can be reborn in the lower realm. Buddha said, no. Although there is still some greed, anger, aversion, pride. The mind is pure enough not to deserve such a lower life. Our life is the result of our mind. When the mind becomes pure and noble, it cannot manifest in a lower form of life. That person can feel that, I cannot be reborn in the lower realms. The first stage eradicates as well telling lies, Musaveda, but the rest of the verbal misdeeds can still happen. A Sotapanna can still talk about things in the newspaper. All rubbish. Misdeeds, my Chikamanto, like killing, stealing, committing adultery. No. 
a Sota Panna can never do that, and also wrong livelihood, my Jivo, cheating in business or things like that. The second stage of enlightenment does not eradicate any defilements, it only weakens them. And the third stage of enlightenment eradicates wrong thoughts, my Chasankapo, slandering, Paisunavaka, and very harsh words, Pharisavaka. Only the fourth stage of enlightenment can eradicate Sam Fapalapa talking about newspapers. And my Chavayama, wrong effort, my Chasamadi, wrong concentration, my Chavimadi, wrong liberation, my Chanana, wrong knowledge. Question and answer. Even though the person has reached the first stage of enlightenment, he still has some defilements, please understand that. Many people say that, this person is supposed to be enlightened and look, he enjoys reading the newspaper, and he enjoys good food or whatever. As long as he keeps his five precepts it is good enough. Question and answer. Some people asked even the Buddha exactly the same question in a slightly different way. They asked are there era ants in other religious groups? Buddha didn't say that there are or there are not era ants in other religious groups. His answer was anybody who practices the Eightfold Noble Path completely can become enlightened and can become an arahant. The criterion is the Eightfold Noble Path. Just study the Eightfold Noble Path and see if you leave out even one aspect of the path, see what will happen. This is just very natural. Think of the eight factors and see if you can leave even one of them out. And still believe that without practicing that one factor one can become really enlightened or liberated. Question and answer. In the Eightfold Noble Path, Vipassana is included as Samasati and Samasamadhi. As for right livelihood, right view, right thinking, how can a person with wrong view and wrong thinking become enlightened? Without right livelihood, without right speech, without right action, without right concentration, and right mindfulness, without right effort, without sila, samadhi, panna, all three, nobody can really become liberated. A person before becoming enlightened must at least be practicing completely the eightfold, noble path. It does not matter for how long or how short a time. Question and answer. Enlightenment goes stage by stage but it can happen in a few moments, in a few minutes, in a few hours from one stage to another. In the texts, I have also read that some people became era ants even in one sitting. Their spiritual qualities are very highly developed. Once they know how to practice, they practice it and break through all the four stages, in one sitting. Question and answer. There is no gap in between. You are not thinking about anything else. One consciousness after another is repeatedly observing very strongly, very clearly, only one aspect of the three characteristics. So that clarity becomes stronger and stronger, and at last, total let go. These are very strong and powerful insights. Even before that you can see Anaxa, Dukkha, or Anatta in a series, without any gap in between, but the insight is weak. But in the last few insights watching becomes stronger, stronger, and stronger. At last the mind is really ready to let go. Question and answer. We can see one aspect at a time, not all at the same time. Question, how do you really know that you are not thinking? Answer. When you really see, you are not thinking. There is no thinking at all. Just like a dark night. You are looking up at the sky and suddenly there is a flash of lightning, you see it and it disappears. At that moment you are not imaging, but you are really seeing it and experiencing it. When it happens it's very different from imagination. In the beginning stage it happens once in a while because you cannot be mindful continuously all the time. And even if you meditate regularly sometimes you see, sometimes you don't see, with different degrees also. Sometimes you see it vaguely, sometimes it's clearer. Upekha is necessary, total equanimity. Total detachment, total balance, just very clear, detached. Watching, watching, not thinking at all. When the mind becomes very close to breakthrough. No thinking at all, things become very fast. Question and answer. From the fourth insight the mind becomes more and more calm 
more and more concentrated. Only briefly in between you might be thinking, but you notice it and it goes away. It is not persistent anymore. It comes very weakly and you can see it and it goes away. In later insights, especially Adanavanana, you begin to think a lot. Oh, so many disadvantages, what is there to enjoy, what is there to be happy about? If you think too much you become very unhappy. Not to think is very important. When you feel disenchanted and become unhappy about the process. If you stop meditating and think about the unhappiness in your daily life you feel like it is unbearable. You feel upset about many things and from seeing the disadvantages. And being disenchanted or unhappy about the physical and mental process you become unhappy about your life situation and that becomes very depressing. When you are experiencing that stage it is very important not to think at all. Thinking is very dangerous, thinking can create so much. You become emotional also. Real insight is not emotional. It is clarity of understanding. Wisdom, here is no satisfaction. There is no enjoyment in this process. Anymore and that is very clear. But if you think about it, you become emotional, unhappy and depressed and all things irritate you more and more, people, noise, and other things irritate you. You get angry sometimes and that becomes an unwholesome mental state, not wholesome anymore. The insight is very wholesome, but when you become angry, upset and depressed it becomes unwholesome. That is why it is very important not to think. Think in process, combined with some samadhi makes things become even more intense. Samadhi makes everything very intense. If you want to enjoy anything make your mind calm and concentrated and you can enjoy it more. When I read books in my mind I very agitated, I cannot enjoy them. If I really want to enjoy a book, a story, a poem, or a saying, I need to make my mind very calm and peaceful. Every word becomes very rich in meaning. I can really enjoy what I am reading. Even scenery, if my mind is calm and I look at the sun rising or sun setting I can get absorbed and it becomes so wonderful, the world is so wonderful. When the mind is agitated, you cannot enjoy it. The same thing, when the mind is concentrated and you think of something frightening, it becomes even more frightening. When you are too agitated, you are not frightened. You are not angry, you are not anything at all, you are too disturbed. A disturbed mind, a very agitated mind cannot take in anything strongly. There is a lot of moha. Adaka is very close together with moha, adaka means scattered mind, agitated. Whenever the mind becomes quiet and concentrated, do not imagine anything, because imagination becomes very real, good, or bad. The most important thing is that, when a thought comes pay very close attention to that thought. If you pay very close attention to it, it will go away. Whenever it comes, just pay very close attention. Just paying attention to the thought will make it go away. And then you bring the mind back to the object of meditation. So don't encourage the thinking. Sometimes people enjoy thinking. If you find that you are enjoying thinking, watch that enjoyment, and watch the wanting to think. Thinking is what creates the I am. When you stop thinking you become very unreal sometimes, you feel that something is missing. Nothing to hold on to. In a way thinking is holding on, grasping, even when you are angry about somebody, you keep thinking about that person. It means that you are attached to that idea, you are attached to what happened and you cannot let go.